be over Matthew chapter 24 tonight if you want to try to find it. I didn't really want to preach on this, just to be honest with you. I already preached on it once this past week during the revival. I taught on it this morning to the youth group of my church. But I'm going to let them do it again, so we're going to go one more time. Earlier, I thought we were going to go over Matthew chapter 23, but it just didn't work out that way. We jumped over a chapter, so that's the way it goes sometimes. We have the very first verse, give me a second. Right, you can make first Yeah. I'm going to open with a word of prayer, if you don't mind. Dear Lord Jesus, please forgive me of all the sins I know I've committed and those I, I don't, especially dear Lord Jesus. Watch over me, take care of me tonight. Lead this message, dear Lord. Use your Holy Ghost to do what needs to be done here tonight. I thank you for your watch, care, and I thank you for your blessings, dear Lord. Just take care of me and my family. And amen. We've heard preachers for years and years and years now tell everybody that Jesus is coming. Anything could happen at any time, that everything's been fulfilled, that needs to be fulfilled so that Jesus can come. But we're going to take a very close look at that tonight. We're going to look at it in the terms of right now, what's already happened. We need to be ready for Jesus' return, and I'll explain to you why as we go through. And starting at verse 1, Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him uh, for to shew him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See you not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he set up on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us when shall these, sign, these things be, and what shall be the signs of thy coming and the end of the world. Even as the disciples were questioning Jesus, they are expecting Jesus' return, the end of the world, to come in their lifetime. It wouldn't have surprised them. They had seen horrible things going on, persecutions for being Christians. They knew what was really happening at this time frame, and they wanted to know what the signs were. I believe that today people are asking, what are the signs? What are the signs of the times? What's letting us know that Jesus Christ will come back at any minute? And we're going to talk about those very things. In verse 4, Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed, no man deceive you. Verse 5, we see him say not to let anybody deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. We've already seen these things happen in past decades and even leading up to now. We've seen Jim Jones and him taking all those people from San Francisco, taking them to travel down to South America, saying that he was Christ, and eventually you hear the saying, don't drink the Kool-Aid. Well, he got up and drink the Kool-Aid. Thousands of people died for a man that claimed to be Christ. He, he had the largest mass suicide ever recorded because he claimed to be something he wasn't. He said he was the Christ. We seen it not too long ago in Waco, Texas, with David Koresh and his compound and all these followers, and he was dividing up the people. He's very charismatic. He was convincing. People believed what he was saying, and in the end, they all burned alive in Waco, Texas because he said he was Jesus Christ. We see these things happening around us, and these are just a few other things we've been watching for. There's many others throughout the world. Let's just name a couple. And then verse 6, And you shall hear wars and rumors of wars. See that you not be troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. As of May 30th, 2015, this is the most recent record that I could actually see. Right now, 65 countries in this world are fully engaged in some type of war. 65 countries. There's 644 militias or some kind of cults involved in this world right now in some kind of military combat. Most of them are now doing it in the name of jihad as a holy war. They're taking on each other's religious beliefs, and that's enough to fight about and kill each other. And that's happening right now. We, as the United States, are on the brink of war with China and Russia and all the Iran, all these other countries right now threatening nuclear war. North Korea is constantly shooting missiles to show us what they can do. And there's all these rumors that at any time we can be at war with any one of these countries. Wars and rumors of wars are happening right now. People thought when World War I came that it was the Great War. It ended all wars. No more. That'd be it. And then we had World War II, and since then we've had so many conflicts throughout this world, and they never cease. It's always ongoing. No matter what country you go to, they're on the brink of war with somebody. They're ready to attack. And God said, don't be sorrowful. This is a good thing. This has to happen. This is a 
sign of my coming. Well, we get nervous. Uh, Jim, he knows his son's been to combat. I've been to combat. When the parents and the family start hearing these wars, rumors of war, and the soldiers, marines, sailors, airmen, are they're saying they might be taken off to war, it's instantaneous that we start to get scared. But God said it's a good thing. Don't be sorrowful. This has to happen. And seven, for nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilence, earthquakes in diverse places. Have we not already seen those things, earthquakes? It was, what, two or three years ago we had an earthquake that rattled Richwood, Craigsville, Summerton, Sutton, Gasoline, earthquakes in Craigsville. We never thought that would happen, but we have. We've seen earthquakes that originated in the ocean and causing tsunamis, wiping out thousands, tens of thousands of people. And these things that we just hadn't talked about in years, we've seen countries just decimated because of earthquakes, starting tidal waves or mudslides, and all these things are happening right now. This isn't something that's happened 20, 30, this is happening right now. It talks about pestilence. Every time you go to any church, and I go to a lot of different churches to preach, Every time you have prayer requests, almost somebody's asking for a prayer for somebody who has cancer. And we've never seen the like of cancer that we see today. On average, 160,000 people will die this year of cancer, and it grows each year. You have HIV and AIDS and all these other STDs that they say that they can't even calculate anymore how many people are dying. And that's even in the U.S. where we have modern medicines. You get over to Africa and these other countries, they don't know how many people are dying of it. But they know it's killing off millions of people across the world. We want locusts or there's something to come up out of the ground. But this is what God predicted. He said this would happen, and it's happening right in front of our very eyes. It's amazing what we're seeing happening in our own times. And yet people have blinders on. But God said, watch for these things. They're going to happen, and they're happening in your and my lifetime. There might not be a soul sitting in this room that makes it home before Jesus Christ comes again. You think that this isn't true. You've heard preachers saying it decade after decade, but right here, what is happening right in front of your very eyes today? It's amazing. And then he says in the next verse, all these are the beginning of sorrow. We haven't even gotten into it. This is just a touch. We see all these people crying over cancers and diseases. We see families decimated because of earthquakes and tsunamis and all these things. And that's just the beginning. We haven't even got to the tip of the iceberg. It's just now starting. This is just to open your eyes that Jesus is coming. And then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. And you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. It's hard to believe, but that's happening right now, even in America. We, we talked about those militias earlier on that are committing jihad and are out on a holy war. There's countries all over the world where if you claim the name of Christ, you will be put to death. Right now, statistics say that every five minutes, somebody's put to death for being a Christian. We heard about little children being slaughtered because they wouldn't say that they believed. That Jesus wasn't really the Son of God and they were beheaded. Right now, sitting in Sudan, in Sudan are two preachers. And they said they're found guilty of their crime. They'll be put to death. Their crime is believing in Jesus Christ. Their crime is preaching the name of Jesus Christ. And they will be put to death because they refuse to deny what they believe. It's coming here to America where we're being tried in the courts and stuff to where we are the offensive ones now. If we say something's not within biblical standards, you can be charged. You can be fined. You didn't think it would happen in your lifetime. We've just seen the courts rule against a bakery because they would have put together a cake for a wedding they didn't agree with. What's your convictions? It's happening now. The Christians are being killed. They say in the 20th century that more Christians became martyrs than if you combined all the martyrs in history before. It's never happened like this. It's never been so offensive to somebody to hear that you're a Christian, to say the name of Jesus Christ. They took it out. We've seen it coming. The Ten Commandments can't be in the courthouse anymore, even though that's what all law should be based on. It's been taken away. Kids are no longer allowed to pray in church. Well, they can pray in church. They can't pray in school. You can't hand out flyers. You're not allowed to hand out Bibles. I know of a church that at a local grade school, they gave book bags. And inside of each one of the book bags, 
They put a King James Version Bible on the school, kept the book bags, and took out the Bibles. Today you can't do those things. It's not okay in the public arena to be a Christian. You're afraid of offending somebody. But in another country, you'd be put to death for that same thing. It's only so long in America to where we're going to see it happen. 9-11 was because they believed we are a Christian nation. Because our money says in God we trust. How much longer before we can see that Jesus Christ is coming? The signs are right here in front of us. And then he will shift. Then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. I should have held off because that's where we are at. Everybody's offended by a Christian. They're offended when you pray over your meal at the restaurant. They're offended when you invite them to church. They're offended when you have posted on your Facebook page. It's amazing that when we get in the public arena, the people come to where they're offended by Jesus Christ. But it's happening here today. You used to be more offensive if your neighbor didn't go to church. You used to be suspicious of that person and think something was wrong with them. But in today's society, it's offensive to be the Christian. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. Are we not seeing that? We see that happening right now, right in the own pulpits of what used to be a church. We see them changing doctrine. If they don't like what the Bible says, they just get a new type of Bible. They take out the verses that they don't like anymore. They change the wording that could offend somebody. And then the preachers stand up here and preach it. If you go to verse 20, or chapter 23 where I started to go to, and it talks about the hypocrites and the Pharisees, that's what it's addressing right there. False doctrine, false teachers. People want to call the church hypocrites. The longer we allow false doctrine to be taught, the bigger hypocrites we become. Even if we offend somebody, that was going to happen. We need to offend somebody and call sin a sin. It says, and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Have you ever seen people have so much trouble with people with cold hearts these days? We're always hearing something about somebody getting shot over road rage. We see fights break out on fast food lines because somebody wasn't quick enough. We see the hearts of many waxing cold right now in front of us. Have you ever seen neighbors treat neighbors the way they do today? Have you seen people run people off the road because they're not going fast enough or they're going too slow? It's amazing. The men's hearts are now cold. And the Bible said it would happen. But in 13, But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Are we willing to endure, church? Are we willing to work for the saved? How many people out there are lost that need this message right now? Jesus is coming back and the signs are there. They're right in front of you. Back in Daniel's time, writing was on the wall. Well, it's writing on the walls today. It's on the Facebook walls. It's on Fox News. It's on CN News. If you look at any of the news, the writing's on the wall that the prophecy is being fulfilled in our day and time. You can see it. It's an amazing thing. You, you know, people have never completely believed what the Bible said. It, 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 Israel was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar in 1586 B.C. And the Bible always promised that it would be put back together. And it didn't happen until 19 but in 2015, we're not trying to recognize Israel. We're trying to recognize Palestine. Our, our, the order of what we should be doing and the way we should be living and the way we should be worshiping, it's all mixed up and nothing's the way it's supposed to be. But God said, don't be sorry. This has to happen. He's coming. But in 14, and this gospel of the kingdom that we preach to all the world for a witness unto the nation, and then shall come the end. The end's coming. If you want to know if the gospel's reached all the nations, right now we're videoing this message right here. Are we not? If anybody has the internet anywhere in the world, they can listen to the same message you're listening to. You can get an old Billy Graham sermon from 50 years ago, and it can reach the entire world. We can reach more people right now than any time. If one message can go across the entire world. If you were in the jungle in the middle of nowhere, you can still get the gospel of Jesus Christ today. The problem is that we're worried about sending it overseas to all these other places, and it's not being preached in West Virginia anymore. It's not being preached in Craigsville, Richwood, Summersville, and Nicholas County. We, we trade it off trying to fulfill this gospel to send it all over the world that we no longer do it in our very own country. There's something off, and the end's coming. It's near. That's what the Bible says. If anybody wants to challenge us, speak up now that the signs aren't all fulfilled. Everything, the 
that Jesus Christ said would happen happened in the last 10 to 15 years. There's nothing else that we need. It's coming. The end is coming. And we're not motivated enough to take the word out into the street. We set it inside of our four walls and we save it up for ourselves and we hold on to our own salvation and we're not taking the word out that the end is coming. We're worried that people will think we're crazy, that we went nuts, but everything's right there. Prophecy is being fulfilled. Just like Israel being returned in 1948, Jesus is coming maybe in 2015. I don't know how much longer it'll be, but I know it won't be long. And I also know that everything that needed to happen has happened now. What are you going to do with that? I've really been challenging people here lately on what it means to be a Christian. There's a lot of people in the church tonight that are, I'm sure, saved. But how many of you are actually a Christian? How many of you are Christ-like? How many of you are trying to just, just to honor Christ with the things that you do? Here in just a few minutes, I'm going to give an altar call. And I've had really good altar calls all week long. And I hope I don't get disappointed here tonight. But I invite you to come to this altar and pray for the lost souls. Because shortly it's going to be too late. Jesus will come again. The Holy Spirit will be taken out. And there will be no more opportunity. Oh, we can talk about the seven years of tribulation, but could you imagine trying to do it then? Now is the time of salvation. What are you going to do? I challenge you tonight when the invitation is given, realizing how little time we have to pray for all the lost souls. Not just raise your hand, not just have an unspoken moment, but actually come to the altar and pray for them and speak it to Jesus. Come and pray in the name of Jesus Christ to make a difference in somebody's soul. Don't just ask for somebody else to do it, but you take the lead. Anytime Jesus asks somebody to follow him, his disciples, he asks them to step out and do something. I challenge the church to do the same thing tonight. If you truly want to be a follower of Jesus, if you want to be a disciple, step out tonight and pray for somebody. Pray for your community. Pray for the lost souls. You hear preachers say all the time, the one nearest hell, well, we never know who it is. I've seen a lot of 30, 20s being killed here lately. Four-wheelers, motorcycles, the weather's warm. People will drown. We never know who's the nearest hell. If they're on your mind, if they're on your heart today, then you need to come and pray for them. But if you're sitting in this congregation today and you don't know Jesus, come and let me pray with you. Come and ask Jesus into your heart and soul. If you're in a car wreck today, do you know for sure that you won't split hell wide open? It won't matter what age you are. If you're old enough to understand this message, you're old enough to go to heaven or hell. You're old enough to make a choice about your own salvation. And I challenge you to do that tonight. I ask you to bow your head and close your eyes for just a minute. Nobody looking around. The only way that can see you, that camera can't see you, the only person that can see you is me. Is there anybody here tonight that's not sure where they're going to go? If you know for sure that you're going to go to heaven tonight, raise your hand. All right, put your hands down. I want you all to start praying real quick. There's some people here that could not raise their hand. I want you to start thinking about your situation in life. Some of you would not be able to make it to heaven today. There's no guarantee based on age. Just by being a member of this church is not good enough. If any of you want to know Jesus tonight, will you raise your hands? Come forward, come forward. Come on up here, let me pray with you. Is there anybody else that wants to know Jesus tonight? Anybody else that wants to make that commitment? Jim, you want to take the lead in this prayer right here? Keep your eyes down, heads bowed, please. Pray for the lost souls here tonight. Anybody else wanting to make that choice here tonight? Church, keep on praying. Decisions are being made, life and death, heaven and hell. There's a young man that couldn't help but look at me the entire time. And I couldn't go and get him. He had to make a decision. He had to step out on his own. Everybody can raise your eyes and look at me now. I'm giving you the altar call. The piano player is going to come and pray for somebody.
somebody. The altar's open. You know that there's people here that need prayer. Come and pray. If you're wanting to be saved tonight, all you got to do is walk up here and let me know. I'll pray with you. If you're not able to get on the floor, feel free to use the front pews. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Bless you.